elephant in the room, this might be the most controversial Supreme Court decision. Which is why I think it's so important that people understand the rationality behind it. Now, if you don't agree with the outcome, don't get mad at me. That would be like blaming the History Channel for the Holocaust. With that said, let's get right into Roe vs Wade, the Supreme Court case that decided once and for all what the best way of crossing a river is. So let's get a little backstory on this case. Jane Roe, a person who I'm sure is ecstatic to have her name attached to the most famous abortion case in the nation, got pregnant in Texas, a state that has a statute on the books that says that abortion can only be given to individuals whose lives are threatened by the pregnancy. And, unfortunately for her, her life was not threatened. Wow, never thought I'd say that. And so she was left with two options. Either go to New York or another abortion-friendly state, or sue the state based on the constitutionality of banning an abortion. We all know which one she chose, and the rest is history. So let's dive into the 1972 case of Roe vs. Wade. First in number 70, 18, Roe against Wade. So an immediate snag in this case was that the Constitution wasn't exactly thorough in its coverage on abortions. We need checks and balances between the executive and legislative branches. Oh, and uh, don't kill the unborn. Certainly we cannot say that there is in the Constitution so stated the right to an abortion, but neither is there stated the right to travel or some of the other very basic rights that this court have held are under the United States Constitution. So how would one even go about starting this conversation? Well, one of my favorite things about Supreme Court cases is that morality doesn't even play a part. It's just like book club for lawyers. So when the author wrote this section, what do you think it meant? While originally representatives from Texas argued that the Constitution didn't define what a person is. The definition of a person is so basic, it's so fundamental, that it is uh, the framers of the Constitution uh, had not even uh, set out to define. Well, they did have the time to specify that Africans were only three-fifths of a person, but besides that, no people defining. Hey, that's more than half. You can round up to someone with rights. That was not where the conversation ended, though, because, as it turns out, there was a better definition of what a person is out there. You see, after the Civil War, the 14th Amendment was put into the Constitution, which distributed rights to its revised definition of a person. And it says that rights are given to any person born or naturalized in the United States. According to the 14th Amendment, rights are guaranteed to all citizens born or naturalized in the United States. Which, at the time, probably seemed like it covered everyone. But, turns out, it didn't cover those not yet born in the United States. It's insane to think how one word had such an impact on so many people. But granting citizenship and rights to every child conceived in the United States would have some insane repercussions. Deferred action for fetal arrivals? You can't deport me because my fetus was conceived in America. I think that would make even Jerry Springer say, uh, can we bring out the guy who married a horse out here instead? So this became one of the central points of contention of this debate. Who does the 14th Amendment cover? Because... Would you lose your case if, a, if the fetus was a person? Then you would have a balancing of interest. Uh, well, you still you have anyway, don't you? Excuse me? You have anyway, don't you? You're going to be balancing the rights of the, of the mother against the rights of the fetus. It seems to me that you do not balance constitutional rights of one person against mere statutory rights of another. So what does it mean when she says that you cannot compare constitutional rights to statutory rights? Well, legally speaking, this would be like trying to defend breaking the Ten Commandments by citing your friend Dave. The statutory rights are the rights that Texas have put in place somewhat recently that were being put into question by the Constitution. It was said multiple times in the case that if the fetus had 14th Amendment protections instead of statutory protections, this entire thing would be incredibly hard to win a debate over. So this brings us to a critical problem of this case, which is, oddly enough, that it seems that the anti-abortion lawyer actually didn't understand how important the decision was. Perhaps it would be better left to our legislators 
uh, there they have the facilities to have some type of medical history brought before and the uh, opinion of the people who are being governed by this. Well, if you're right that an unborn fetus is a person, then you can't leave it to the legislature to play fast and loose with that, dealing with that person. In other words, uh, if you're correct in your basic submission that an unborn fetus is a person, then abortion laws such as that uh, which New York has is grossly unconstitutional. What he was proposing was leaving it up to the legislature, which would make this a state-by-state -state issue. But according to the judges, no! If legally speaking fetuses are humans, that would mean it would be insane to regulate the life of that legal human state by state. Oh yeah, maybe you can't kill that person in Texas, but just go on a trip out to New York City and commit murder there. So it was clear that this case was either going to ban or legalize abortions. This argument also led to the potential weakness in a side argument for legalizing abortions as well. because. If you want to say that someone only gets rights once it's born, then it would make it really, really hard to argue that nine months into a pregnancy, you can't abort it. Just listen to the abortion legislation advocate try to tiptoe her way around this question. Could Texas constitutionally, in your view, uh, declare that by statute that uh, uh, a fetus is a person for all constitutional purposes after the uh, third month of uh, gestation. I do not believe that the state legislature can determine the meaning of the federal constitution. I guess she couldn't have responded by saying the go-to, I do not recall, but it might have almost been more dignified for her to just plead the fifth. Alright, so unless morality is going to mix with the constitution, it seems as though we might have a dilemma there. Now this time problem wasn't exactly resolved in this case itself. In fact, late-term abortions weren't banned in the United States until 2007's Gonzalez vs. Carhartt, but was rather left up to the doctor's morality in the states. Doesn't it follow from that then that a woman can come into a doctor's office and say, I want an abortion? And he can say, I'm sorry, I don't perform them. And then what does she do? She goes elsewhere. This brings us to another point of contention, how big the Texas statute was. Now, this might be confusing because the Texas statute might be one of the least vague things I've ever seen put in front of the Supreme Court. If the birth will kill the mother, she can abort, and if it won't, she can't. Not really a lot of room for interpretation there. So how can you call that vague? Well, because of the reason the law was put into place. While it probably doesn't seem like it should matter, it seems as though legislators might have more stumbled into protecting fetuses rather than setting out to do so. Because the intent was that these laws were on the books to protect the mother rather than the baby. The state has alleged, and its only alleged interest in this statute, is the interest in protecting the life of the unborn. However, the state has not been able to point to any authority of any nature whatsoever that would demonstrate that this statute was in fact adopted for that purpose. So why does that matter? Well, if your goal is to protect the mother, then legalizing abortions doesn't change the outcome. In fact, in the law as it stood, the woman was the victim and the doctor was the perpetrator. It would be like if you legalized medical marijuana to help people deal with cancer. But then you realize that people suffering from the terrible affliction of boredom were buying marijuana as well. So you decide to make it illegal for stoners based on the fact that you need to help people with cancer. That argument just doesn't make sense. Now you could change the law, but this would raise all sorts of questions. For example, So many things that just don't make sense. If the, if the statute was adopted for that purpose, for example, why is the woman guilty of no crime? If the statute was adopted for that purpose, why is it that the penalty for abortion is determined by whether or not you have the woman's consent? If the fetus is indeed changed to be the new reason the laws are in place, then legally speaking, some, including our president, would argue that the woman should be the one getting punished for the abortion. Yes, Do you believe yes. in punishment for abortion, yes or no, as a principle? Uh, the answer is that there has to be some form of punishment. For the woman? Yeah. In his defense, Trump's like a sorority girl on spring break. If you put a camera in front of him, he's gonna go wild. So these Texas laws were not punishing the woman, but rather the doctors for performing the illegal abortions. 
This brings us to a major concession that the anti-abortion advocate made in this debate. Dr. Flower, doesn't the fact that so many of the state abortion statutes do provide for exceptional situations in which abortion may be performed, and presumably these did date back a great number of years, uh, following Mr. Justice Stewart's comment, suggest that the, that the absolute proposition that a fetus from the time of conception is a person just is at least against the weight of, of historical legal approach to the question. Yes, sir, I would think possibly that that would indicate that. Um, did the anti-abortion defendant just say that? Because some abortions can be performed in exceptional situations, legal history dictates that fetuses aren't people? Man, a better defense would just be to try and slide the judge a 20 to change his mind. And that's saying something. Now, I cut a lot of pauses out of this case, but this might be the worst argued case I've ever heard from both sides. The judge had to help the abortion advocates remember people's names and correct them when they misspoke. And this guy was conceding points like a tobacco spokesperson who hadn't yet learned how to lie. Now, the last point I want to get to here is legal precedent, because both sides had a few landmark cases in their holsters. First. Let's go to the anti-abortion spokesman. Uh, the Memorial case versus Anderson, a New Jersey Supreme Court case. Uh, the court, this was a case where the pregnant woman had refused on religious grounds to undergo a blood transfusion and in order to save the child. Uh, the court held that the right of the child to live and uh, to be born was paramount over this pregnant woman's right of religion. Now, if you're against abortion and want to win an argument, you're definitely going to want to remember this 1964 case. The basic idea was that a Jehovah's Witness, also known as the only people who still knock, was having a baby, although that baby was going to die if a blood transfusion wasn't administered. The mother pled the First Amendment, specifically religious freedom, that the blood would not be transfused because it was against her beliefs. But the Supreme Court ruled that, in this case, the life of the fetus was more important than the woman's constitutional rights. The line drawn, whether arbitrary or not, was that this case was about compulsory medical treatments for saving lives, rather than about elective medical operations for taking them. So now to the other side where we see There have been two cases uh, decided since the December 13th argument that expressly hold that a fetus has no constitutional rights. One ber being ber uh, Byrne versus New York and the other being the McGee Women's Hospital cases. The case of Byrne versus New York was reported by the New York Times in 1973 which said, The Supreme Court denied a rehearing to anti-abortion forces in New York and Connecticut who were seeking to overturn the court's January decision that prohibited state interference with termination of pregnancy in all but the last 10 weeks. The difference between this case and Roe vs. Wade was that this case was trying to make voluntary abortion illegal in a state where it was legal, although this decision was one of the first ones to officially use the 14th Amendment to recognize the lack of rights given to a fetus. Now, for those of you who aren't aware, the Supreme Court case of Roe vs. Wade in a 7-2 decision voted it unconstitutional to ban abortions in any state after hearing this case, and the rest is history. Sorry for this dark episode, but I was genuinely curious how this case was argued on both sides. Thank you, and that's all I have to say about that. Hello YouTube, I hope you enjoyed that last video. For more episodes of Supreme Court Saturday, click here, and subscribe by clicking here. And if you enjoyed this episode, just remember to like